and put the, uh, the, you notice there's a square and then a rounded piece here. The rounded piece goes to the inside of the cell. Okay. So put it in through the top and slide it in at the bottom. And don't tighten it yet. Put all three on. But don't tighten them up because you don't want to have uneven tightening of these of the cell. It's just like your car tire. You want to tighten. Go opposite ends, but we only have three here, so we can just go just tighten with the same amount of torque. with each one. And make sure it's nice and tight. Sometimes you want to kind of wiggle top and bottom to make sure it's aligned appropriately. Well, you get a nice surprise when you put a good pressure on the inside. Okay, so now our sample is uh, installed into the cell, ready for testing. Um, one thing I do want to do is, uh, well, no. I think we're, uh, I, I do want to point out that we have this little bleed screw here at the top of the cell that I have completely out now, but you don't have to remove it. We just have to make sure that when we fill the cell with water, we can evacuate the air that's in there. And that's what this is for, this bleed screw is for that. And then we'll tighten that up once it's completely filled with water. Okay. At this point now, what we're ready to do is go to the software and begin the test. Okay. <clears throat> so we can do that. Um, we're going to run a triaxial CU test on this sample here uh, for demonstration purposes. So we're at the main screen of the DS7 software. We're going to have at the bottom lower left corner, we're have, going to click the cell called New Test, and the button called New Test. And then it's going to ask us to select the type of machine for the testing. Now we're going to click the triaxial CU CD. It's available. If it wasn't available, it would be grayed out and it would just say in use, and we'll show that in a minute. So we click on which machine we want, either a UU test or a CU is our, are our options right now. Select machine for test, and it takes us to the sample identification form. Now this form is used to just provide all information about that sample that we want. Okay. Um, so for instance, uh, the, the company name, the project name, the project number, uh, the type of sample, how it was, how it was sampled, how it was generated. We, we it was remolded in this case. Um, when it was sampled, any kind of information you want about the sample would go into this screen here. Okay, but I, I, I will say that the, the this screen requires that you must. You don't have to fill out all of them, but you must fill out four cells on this screen, and those four cells are identified by uh, a star. Um, they are company name job number, sample number, and specimen number. Now the reason those are required to be filled out is because the DS7 utilizes those, the information that's provided in those cells for a hierarchy of Windows folders. So that's how it stores the, that's how it names and stores folders within the DS7 software itself. So you must put information in there. So uh, typically what I do, I'll do company name, I'll just put test, job number one, sample number one, and specimen number is A, B, C, or D. You can't change that. It's either A, B, C, or D. What that means is typically in triaxial tests, you want to run two, three, or four samples out of the same, uh, specimens out of the same sample tube or bulk sample to provide the appropriate more circles within the more Coulomb failure envelope. And that allows you to make sure that you don't have the same file or folder uh, name the same thing. We don't have the same specimen named A, or all of them named A, so we, we, we label them A, B, C, D. So we'll call this one A. We can come over here to sample type and say it's a, um, a bulk disturbed sample is fine or whatever you would like to. But like I said, you don't have to fill anything else out and I won't. Then I come over here and click OK. And now that, that machine has a test in progress. This is the test in progress screen, <coughs> which you get to um, from the monitor test button on the front menu. 
Okay. So if I click cancel and go to new test, now you'll see that that Triaxial CU machine is in use. I can't use that machine right now. I can't even click on it because I've already initialized the test. So if I return to main menu and go to monitor test, there's my machine and I can go to it now. It's between stages. So I click on that one, click OK at the bottom, and this takes me to the test monitoring screen. Okay. Now the test monitoring screen is the main screen you'll use for testing. Okay. This is the uh, this is the screen that you will you will learn to like if you do a lot of tests because this tells you everything you need to know about the test. It tells you the the readings that the test is providing um, and and any live readings, everything. So let's let's explain this test, this screen very quickly. Uh, on the upper left corner, you'll see that there are, it'll explain the machine, the job number, the sample number, all of that. Um, so it just gives you what you're looking at here. It also gives you underneath, it gives you a current test stage and a previous test stage. That allows you to know uh, what stage or portion of the test that you're testing at right now because there are lots of there are six stages to a triaxial test that you need to understand and also for instance if you are coming in uh, you say you started the test and you're saturating the sample and then you don't come in the next day but you have another technician here you can call him up and say okay can you take a look at that test for me and they can look at it and say oh okay he was he's currently on saturation and the previous test was cell pressure saturation, so okay, I know what I need to do next. Assuming that the sample is ready to move on. So it just gives you some information right, on, right at the top. Okay, the buttons on the right are the main buttons that you'll use for uh, throughout the test. Start test stage and end test stage are the two buttons you'll use the most. If you notice, the end test stage is grayed out. You can't, even, you can't even click on end test stage because you haven't started the stage yet. You're not in a current test stage, so you can't end it but you can start a test stage and what that'll do is bring up a menu of all the stages and, and it'll tell you step by step which ones to click and what to, get, what to do. Uh, current test details, if you click on that button, it'll take you back to the sample ID form just so you can, you can change things in here midstream if you don't have some information but you want to add some to it. Click OK, take you back to here. Full screen just takes those uh, any graphs and you can put them on a screen and then print them out if you wish to show an engineer to see what the progress of the tests are. And OK gets you out of the screen even while the test is running. OK just takes you out of the test screen and allows it to just continue to run and it takes you back to the main screen if you want to run simultaneous tests. For instance, say I want to take a look at my consolidation test that I have going on. I can click OK, come back to here, go to monitor, find my consolidation test and click over to that. Remember, the ADU is simultaneously and independently monitoring every input channel at all times. Okay. Now, you have two graphs here. Um, these are the graphs that tell you what's going on with the test during the test stage. <coughs> Typically, the left graph is what you'll be looking at the most. The left graph is some sort of, uh, uh, for instance, in the, um, in the cell pressure saturation stage, you'll be monitoring the B value. So the left stage, the left graph will be the actual B value calculated or saturation level calculated. The right graph will be just the pore water pressure versus the pore water pressure versus time. Some sort of ancillary uh, monitoring of a of of a, of data that goes along with what you're what you're looking at for your test stage. Okay. Now beneath that, you'll have a readings taken and a readings remaining. Now what that really is for. It's, it does have a uh, it does have a limit of how many how many readings it will take, but what I use it for is to show me where um, where I am or what number reading I'm on, because typically when you when you when you're monitoring data using this ADU, it doesn't monitor data every second and give you the readings every second. Now it does in the live readings at the bottom, but it doesn't do this on the graph. What it does is, for instance, during the saturation level, it'll, it'll take the root time um, uh, readings, which means that it will, it'll take a reading and then square it, take the next reading, square that time, take the next reading. And what that does is allow it to monitor your data, but doesn't fill up your computer with a whole lot of data. If you were to monitor 
every stage of every triaxial test for 72 hours every second, you would have extremely lengthy data files, which will start eating away at your memory. So it doesn't do that. What it does is takes root or square readings, root time for your readings. But if, for instance, you're taking, you're you're doing a sample, you you're saturating a sample, and you haven't taken a, you you've been doing it for say two days, and you want to come in and you want to see what kind of changes it's made. You can look at the readings taken and the readings remaining and say, okay, I've taken 31 readings, I've got 20 left. Now I can go somewhere and come back and, oh, it still has 31 readings taken. So it hasn't taken a new sample yet, so I can't look at my new graph. But I can come back, and, but, so I can use these as a reference point. But it also makes sure I know, uh-oh, I've only got a few more samples because it does have a limit to how many samples it takes as well. Okay? Uh, the next is a test idle. This is a, it says test idle now because we're not doing anything, but this is a, uh, a bar that, that explains what's going on in the test, whether it's taking data, um, if there's an error, it'll tell you an error message. Test idle is telling us that now. And then beneath that, you have the time and the date. Okay? And then at the very bottom, you have all transducers associated with this machine in a live reading, changing every second. That these are not recorded on any file, they're just for you to monitor. Okay? So uh, I can always look and see what's going on with any transducer at all times. Okay? For instance, I know that I've got 5 kPa on my cell pressure, I've got negative 2 on my pore pressure and negative 2 on my back pressure that I need to make sure I correct. <clears throat> okay? So um, that's the test monitoring screen. Now we can go through and start a test. We've already inputted our sample into our cell. Let's go ahead and start a triaxial CU test. And remember, the software tells us step by step how to do the test. So let's just read the instructions on the screen and do what it tells us to do. Okay? So the first thing I want to do is start test stage. It takes me to the stages that are required for the triaxial test. It, and if you notice, you can't do anything until you go to the test initialization. And what that does is it provides all the information, or we need to provide the information for the actual test. What are we going to do? What required effective stress? What are the, the measurements of the sample itself? Those sort of, that sort of information is required to be in here before we start the test. So we'll go ahead and, well, first of all, I'm going to click OK because what I forgot to do is go back to configure to the system settings and change this because I want to do my test in Imperial units. Okay? So change it to Imperial, click OK, go back to monitor test, click the test I want, click OK, start test stage, test initialization, OK, and now everything is in inches and pounds and PSI. Okay, that's how I want to test. So the diameter of this sample is 2.8 inches. I've already done a measurement. I've done three measurements and, and uh, took an average. The height of it is 5.6, which is twice the diameter, which is required by ASTM. The sample weight, I did a, uh, I did a weight measurement. It's about 2.8. And it automatically, well, I think it was 2.6, I'm sorry. It automatically come up with the bulk density of the sample, which is 130 pounds per cubic foot, which is pretty high but it's pretty wet. Okay. Um, the mounting method, it's either wet or dry. I'm gonna say wet. Side drains, I'm not using side drains on this sample, but these are side drains. What they are is just filter paper that you can wrap around the sample inside the membrane to increase the, the time at which it saturates. It allows water to infiltrate the sample from the side. <clears throat> ASTM allows that, but it also requires you to have um, uh, correction factor because that what what you're doing is if you put something around it you're adding strength you're also adding strength by the by the membrane itself so we have a Young's modulus and we have a thickness of the membrane and if we click on side drains we also have a load constant which is a, a factor that's uh, fairly constant with uh, filter paper that's already in there and then we have the perimeter which we need to measure the amount the, the perimeter of the filter paper throughout the perimeter of the sample the measurement of, in inches of the perimeter and those are, those are correction factors that the software uses that ASTM requires uh, to get the appropriate uh, load, corrected deviator stress during the shearing portion of the test. We're not going to use side drains in the sample, so we'll turn that off. And then we have test conditions. Now these test conditions are what the engineer or the, the researcher, whatever, will decide how they want the sample to be tested. Okay? Typically you want uh, we'll start off with the required effective stress. That is the either 
uh, some sort of effective stress required uh, at a depth or uh, a double that or, or times four that. I mean, I mentioned before that you typically want to do three or four samples to provide multiple more circles so you can get your line of impact through your cohesion and the angle for your angle of internal friction. But in order to do that, you have to change your required effective stress. Typically, you start off with some sort of value, whether it be uh, the standard uh, effective stress at the elevation that you that you sampled, then you double that, and then you double that number, or times four the original, something like that. But you need to change that effective stress for sample. Um, so, for instance, this one we want a required effective stress of say 25 psi. Um, cell pressure increment in steps. What that is, is it, that confuses people sometimes. What all that is, is it just, uh, during saturation, you want to increase your cell pressure and monitor the amount of increase in pore pressure. That's what B value is, or saturation is. It's the ratio between increase in cell pressure versus the increase in pore pressure, because water is incompressible, and if you increase the confining pressure, it should increase the pore pressure inside. But that cell pressure is just a, it, just a value that, it, that the software uses to increase the cell pressure in the steps that it takes during the saturation stage. Um, you can put any value in there you wish. I don't like to go too, don't like to go higher than the effective stress. Typically, I'm just going to put in 10 psi for now. And you can look at that and research that if you wish and change that value. Now, the third piece of information you need for the test condition is the back pressure differential. What that means is you need to have a difference between what's going on inside the sample and what's confining it outside the sample. Because if you have too much pressure going inside, it'll start to expand your sample and ruin. So you need to make sure your confining pressure is higher than your back pressure or the pressure that's going inside your sample. And typically, I, uh, I think ASTM has some sort of recommendation on that. Um, uh, between 5 and 25 kPa, which is about between 1 and 7 or so psi. I like to keep that right around a half to 1 psi. So I'll just put 1 psi. Okay. And then I confirm the setup. And then I just follow, again, follow the instructions on the screen. Vent the pressure transducers to atmosphere and reset them. If you notice, they're not all at zero. They're pretty close to zero, but they're not all. So let's go ahead and what does venting them mean? Well, venting them means you open them to atmosphere. Sometimes you get a little water leakage coming out. And then you hit the red button, and it'll make all these values zero. Okay. Then tighten them back up. For the pressure, for the pore water pressure, if you notice, there's a valve before and after, which I've mentioned. We only use this back valve, we only open this back valve when we're de-airing the line, which we've already seen. Once we have that closed, we want to keep it closed. That's the reason we have this tube here coming in from the back pressure line. It's just for de-airing purposes. What we want to do now is open the one between the sample and the pore pressure so we can monitor the amount of pore pressure within the sample. So keep this back one closed, keep the front one open during testing. Okay. The other two remain closed, or the other three I should say, remain closed until the software tells you to open them. The back one is just for de-airing again, so you never open that one either. The back pressure valve and the, port, the cell pressure valve are open and closed throughout the test. The software will tell you how to do that. So we've step one we've done. Next is step two, mount the sample, which we've already done, and fill the triaxial cell. Well, how do we do that? We've already